Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's guest. We've been, we've been working hard to, to get him on the show, and it's been a struggle, but now he's here. But before we talk to our guest, I'd remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Scott Todd, from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com. And most importantly, if you're not automating your Craigslist and Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? Pulse is still normal. Respiration's fine. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to talk to our guests. Um, before we talk to our guests, I do want to remind everybody today's podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. You can always make more money. But you can't get more time. Automate it, baby. You like that, Scott? I do. It's not just about automating it. It's about breaking the algorithm that is holding you back from getting your ads to stick. So it's all in one. It's all in one. It's all in one. Let's talk to Paul Jarvis. Paul Jarvis has shown people how to kick ass at the intersection of creativity and commerce since 1999. Paul Jarvis is currently writing a book called Company of One which is being published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Um, he is the hardest working creative you'll meet. He's a designer, an author, a teacher, software creator, and podcaster. He's written four books, built several software companies, and has taught over 10,000 students through his online courses, creative class, Chimp Essentials, and Grow Your Audience. He also hosts two podcasts, The Sunday Dispatches and Invisible Office Hours. As a trend buster and business strategist, Paul has collaborated with some awesome people and companies, including Daniel, Danielle Laporte, Marie Forleo, Mercedes-Benz, Microsoft, and Warner Music. His work has appeared in Fast Company, CNBC, Forbes, Newsweek, BuzzFeed, Lifehacker, and his writing reaches over 50,000 people every month. But finally, he is on a prestigious podcast, The Art of Passive Income Model Podcast. Paul, you've made it. Congrats. How are you? I'm good. Hey, Mark. Hey, Todd. Or, hey, Mark, hey, Scott, sorry. It's all right. That happens all the time to him. That's what happens when you have two first names. Yeah. So, Paul Jarvis, how, does, how do you become Paul Jarvis? Like, what happened? Um, well, basically, you become as unemployable as possible and just start to run lots of wacky experiments for yourself with your own income. And that's really, like, how it started. Like, I didn't want to be an entrepreneur. I didn't really want to work for myself. I just kind of lucked into it, I guess. I quit one job. I was going to find another job and that didn't happen. And here we are like almost 20 years later. Well, you must love it though. I mean, you're so prolific. It is pretty, like, I'm not going to lie. It's pretty awesome. Like I really enjoy being able to sit in my underwear in my home office and, and get work done. It is a lot of hard work and it does, it can be obviously stressful. It can obviously be lonely as well when you work for yourself and you work at home, you're by yourself. Like I have my pet rats to keep me company, my wife when she's not working, but unless I actively work at uh, relationships with people, I'm just sitting here by myself all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the books. Let's just talk about your current book, Company of One. What is that all about? Sure. So I started out, to rewind a little from that, I started out self-publishing books. So I wrote, I don't even remember, I think four, whatever my bio said, I think I wrote four or five books. And they did fairly well. I self-published those. And then I decided, okay, I kind of, I get self-publishing. Like, I don't know everything about self-publishing, but I've sold like 70, 80,000 copies. It's been translated into lots of languages. I kind of got the gist of it. And I felt like, what if I tried to traditionally publish a book, which obviously has its pros and cons. So I found a literary agent, which I didn't even know what that was up until this year, because I asked some friends who would publish books and they said, well, you need an agent. And I was like, what's an agent? And then I, then I learned. And then I got a, I got a publishing deal uh, with, like you said, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, um, probably about three weeks ago as of recording this. So now I'm basically writing a book uh, with them. My editor, Rick Wolf, did Cal Newport's books, Alex Ohanian's books. So he knows a ton about that. And really what the book is, um, the topic and the thesis is really 
is growth always the best idea? And spoiler alert, it's not <laughs> in business. So growing in all directions, in all ways, scaling everything from employees to expenses to infrastructure doesn't always make the most sense. And I'm kind of making a case for why that isn't the case, even though that's typically what business says. But Paul, Scott, Todd, and I love the 10X rule. We love Grant Cardone. We, we love uh, Gary V. These guys are the religion of growth. They, they are the religion of big goals. They and are. Now, you're, now you're coming on this podcast <laughs> and you're stomping our ambition? Why? Why, Paul Jarvis? Why? <laughs> So I think all those things are, are not bad goals to have, right? Like all of those things are, are fine to have as long as they're questioned. Like if you want to like 10 X your revenue, but you don't necessarily want to have like the employees that it takes, or you don't necessarily, maybe you don't want to spend the time that it requires on that. Maybe you want to spend, maybe you want to have more balance, right? You maybe you want to have more time with like your wife and your kids or, outside in the garden as well as working and making money and hustling and doing all of the Gary, the Gary V things. But I think that there can be, uh, there can be a balance and there can be uh, almost like an enough. And I don't think that's talked about very often, especially not in the circles that you mentioned where like for me personally, like I make enough money. So me making more money means I have to work harder, means I have to have more responsibility, means I have to do all of these things that I probably don't want to do. And so I'm just not going to do it. Like I already, I support myself. I have lots of uh, things that I invest in. So I feel like there, uh, there can be a question of like, am I doing well enough to kind of not have to work? Because in my twenties, like I worked 20 hours a week and it was, it was hard. Like I had basically no life because I was just working. And then in my thirties, I, my body, one, my body couldn't handle working that much and as i'm almost 40 my body seriously can't handle like just sitting at a computer all day and i wouldn't have any relationships like i probably wouldn't be married if i didn't like make time for my wife <laughs> it's funny how spouses want you to make time for them sometimes so i i think that there's that there's a balance that needs to happen like i think growth is fine as long as this question as long as it makes sense like to check some balances of growth if that makes sense to you then grow in whichever means necessary but if it doesn't, then maybe you can think like, okay, success might mean something different to me than it does to, to Gary or to, to Scott or to Mark kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's funny because Paul, you are kind of preaching to the choir, uh, at least, <laughs> at least to me, but I, let's talk to Scott Todd, who is a massive Grant Cardone fan. Scott is Paul well, Jarvis, well, you no, know, no. Uh, uh, just uh, a non, not just, not just not ambitious. Like what is this enough? Concept. No, no, no. I do, I do think that, I do think there's, there's enough, right? Like it, it, I think it all depends on what you want. Okay. Like if you, if you want the yacht, well then you got to keep working towards the yacht. Right. But if you're happy and content with what you've created, it markets the fisherman story, right? You know, like you, if you, if you're happy being a Mexican fisherman, going out in the water, catching a couple of fish, feeding your family, enjoying life, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. It doesn't make you, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're like a terrible person. Um, Paul, I, I would say too, that the other, the other thing is that, you know, just to grow, just to, you know, like for growing for growth's sake is in fact a, a bad idea, especially if, if you don't have your numbers, right. You know, like if, if your business is out of whack and I had that happen to me. So like Mark, I actually had a company that um, it was, it was pretty large. I mean, you know, like it was self-sustaining. It was, I wasn't working it every single day. I was like that silent owner and people were running it for me. And I did well with one location. And then I opened up a second location and it's like the uh, train, tr the train went off the tracks, right? The numbers on the back end weren't right. And you, they were hidden. They were hidden from you on uh, one, one location but when you got to the second one, you really saw the, the imperfections in the model. And then it was like over, it brought the whole thing down, right? So uh, just, just to grow, just, you know, just say, hey, I'm growing. I got another location. I think it's a terrible idea. You got to have your numbers right too. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, and, and Paul Jarvis, you know, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, we do, you know, I think everybody kind of sort of understands that we've seen this, the happiness studies, right? 
after 75,000 a year incrementally, right? We don't get much happier. There is a law of diminishing returns with money. That being said, one of my favorite new shows now is Billions on Showtime, right? So Paul, how, you know, and capitalism doesn't care about our happiness, right? So Paul, how do we step back and, and actually dig deep and figure out individually what makes us happy, what is enough, and then go ahead and execute on it? Yeah, I think, and that's a good question. And I think for, for what I've found, because I've been doing a lot of research for this book, and, and what I've found is that consistency is the best tool for truth that we have, right? And what I mean by that, is, and that's really the scientific method. So if we are unhappy at the size that our business is consistently, then something needs to change. If we're happy with the way that it's going, the way that it's growing, the way that all the numbers are working out consistently, then things are, things are probably fine. So I think a lot of that comes down to just like, it's interesting because I think in Western society, it's, it's delegated to the realm of like hippies and new agers with things like introspection. So actually thinking like, is this thing making me happy? Like, is this, is this yacht as, as Scott has at that 5,000 foot yacht? Is this yacht making me happy? Do I need more yachts to do more fit? Like the, the, like the story goes, like, do I need to hire more people to run the yachts for me? And then what I found as well is that in talking to people, a lot of times people are, they feel like they need to grow because that's what success means. And I think that there can, there can be a challenge there with introspection. So if I'm happy doing say design, right. But, if, and I grow my company and then I hire designers and then all I'm doing is managing designers. Then I wasn't really introspective there because the thing that I liked the most about my job was designing. And now I've grown my business to a place where I don't actually get to design because I have too much time spent managing designers or dealing with clients or talking to like support and development. So I think that introspection is always, is always the most important thing. And introspection comes from looking at consistency because that's where, that's where truth lies. Well, what about the truth of suffering? Like for example, Scott Todd, when you first started uh, land investing, right? There's a bit suffering involved with that. Do you right. remember? I remember. It yeah. wasn't easy, right? Wasn't you remember your, your first month and the yellow letters? Yeah, it's brutal. And then the feeling of, oh my gosh, I've got so much, I've got a, I've got a timeline here where I'm going to be out of this job, right? I got to protect my family. There's a bit of anxiety, <laughs> right? To protect your family. There is a huge, I mean, I wouldn't say a huge, but there is a learning curve. There's suffering involved. So what you come out of that suffering and a, and a good example is, you know, like, cause we, you know, we're just coming off of mother's day, right? Every mother knows this, this feeling of I'm never having a child again. Right. And then all of a sudden the baby smiles and they forget all the pain and suffering they went through. <laughs> right. And the swollen ankles and the, and the hard nights and all that, because they're, they just remember that last fact of love and affection and, you know, pure bliss of having this newborn baby. So are we discounting suffering in this, in this process? I think that's, uh, I think that's, uh, especially when you, when you work for yourself, there's, and especially in the beginning, there's going to be suffering involved because you don't like hardly ever does somebody start out like instantly successful. Like you don't open a shop and there's like lines of people. That's not really the norm. But I think what, what, and, and to bring this back to growth as well, is I think that if you figure out a way to start the idea as small as possible, and as quickly as possible, then you can, then you can kind of mitigate that suffering to just be a little bit. Like if I was just starting out doing, like if I was just starting a company, I wouldn't think about like, okay, how am I going to find, like, I, okay, I need to find office space. I need to buy a bunch of fax machines because this is like 1989. I would think about how can I help one person? Like how can I find that first client and then help that person? And I wouldn't care about infrastructure or even systems and processes in the beginning, because that person would help kind of guide me into what it is that they need the most or what they value the most. Then I would get another customer 
And then I would maybe buy a laptop after I've helped a couple people. And then I might like buy a desk to sit at. So I'm not sitting at my coffee table. So I think that there's the, the way to, to mitigate that is to move somewhat quickly. And just because I think a lot of people sit on ideas or they think that their idea has to be so big that they can't launch until it's big. Like they can't, they need like, 100k to launch their business and i think that i think that that also needs to be challenged right like that like maybe you can start smaller maybe you can start sooner if you start smaller and maybe you can kind of build up as you go with with that so i that, i don't know life is suffering like <laughs> really life is suffering Life is suffering I, for sure. And, and, and I can and, relate to that yeah. because like I, I, you know, like I remember I, I was sitting in my, at uh, my office one day and I came up with this great idea, right? Like, and it was, it was a big idea, right? Like it was, it was big. Okay. And um, I looked and I'm like, man, this is going to take a lot of effort. So I need, like, I started putting paper to it, right? Cause I'm going to need, I'm going to need offices. I'm going to need people. I'm going to need computers. Like I'm budging this whole thing out. Next thing you know, I need like a million dollars just, just in infrastructure, just in like technology. And I'm like, well, how am I going to get a million dollars? This isn't going to work. Right. And so it was, it was an idea that was like, it went nowhere. Okay. Like, because I killed it because of the million dollars. And now I'm, now I'm thinking back. Okay. So like, let, let's replay that scenario. It didn't have to be that big. I didn't have to go that large. I could have done it in a different way. And I could have, like you said, I could have gone to one company and solved that problem and applied my, my thesis or my thought process behind it and then said, okay, well, did this work? If so, yes. And then I could expand it. But I think what happens is when you work, when you work for a, you know, like in a company, you don't start off failing, right? Like you don't start off small. You don't start off with this thing that says, I'm just going to try to solve this one problem because the companies already solved that problem. You're not having to start from scratch. And if you just give yourself permission to say, I just want to solve this one little problem and prove to myself it, it, this will work, then I can start to, the, the building of the snowball. But I wanted to scale like today and it killed it. Yeah, and, and Paul would say, why? did you want to scale? Right. Because that's, that's what you do, right? Like that's, I mean, like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you hear about this, this company and it, you've never heard about it before in your life. And Mark, I, I mean, privately before this call, I was telling you about this uh, company that I, I read about, you know, like 30, 30 year old billionaire, Paul it's, Jarvis. It's, it's Instacart, right? Like Instacart goes from foundation in 2012 to, you know, 2017, five years, their value is what, $3 billion. I mean, in five years, three, zero to five to three billion. Man, there are huge companies that are not like that. But you know what, Mark, the thing is, is that the guy that created the company, it did read this and it's to Paul's point, the guy that created the company because that's a shopping service. He went out and he bought groceries himself and delivered them himself. He didn't scale to having all these people do the work. He went out, proved the, proved the concept, and then started growing. And it's that foundation that he wanted that built that to a three billion dollar so, so company. Paul Jarvis, how do you reconcile all the let's call it business porn that we read? Right. So I pick up Fortune, I pick up Forbes, I pick up Inc. Five Hundred, and it is literally the you know religion of growth you know, talking about how this 30 year old became a billionaire overnight and Instagram billionaire, you know, uh, the valuation of Uber billionaire. And all of a sudden, you know, we start comparing ourselves to these guys or gals, right? Comparison is sort of like the thief of happiness, but we want to, you know, what, what, what was that uh, phrase? Did you ever read Ernest Becker, uh, the denial of death? No. Did you ever read that Scott? Uh, I did not. I talked to immortality project. We all have like these immortality projects, right? We want to leave something. How do you reconcile that, Paul? Yeah, it's because we, we all want to, to, to have a legacy, I think, especially people that work for themselves, especially because of, like I'm in software as well, like especially with software, you want to build that thing. But I think there's also a lot of like with, with every story like that, there's, there's this inherent survivorship bias where 
we're only ever going to read about or hear about the people that have done something exceptional, right? Like the, the Instacart story or the like Snapchat IPO, which then their stock then didn't, it, it isn't doing that great. But like there's kind of this survivorship bias where we see all of these things and we're only shown positive affirmations of the goals that we have. So we only see like, oh, well, this person's made it. Well, this person's made it because there are no websites or publications dedicated to the people who tried and failed. Whereas in our own lives, we try and fail. Like pretty much everybody I know tries and fails all the time. I, I have launched so many projects that have gone nowhere. I've launched so many software services that didn't work out for the one that did work out kind of thing. So I think, like you said, comparison is the, the thief of joy. And I think a lot of times we're comparing apples to elephants. Like we're comparing one tiny speck of what we know about one person and their success to our entire lives. So we could be successful in some other way if somebody was looking in on us. And I think that it, it's important to kind of look at the, um, look at the difference between how we perceive ourselves versus how the outside world perceives us. Because typically it's incredibly different, right? So when we're looking at other people, how they, we might read like in Forbes that this person is a success, but maybe they've just gone through like a horrible divorce or maybe it took them 15 years to come up with Instacart after failing. Like, I don't know the guy's story, but like for anybody for, to get to that billion dollar, $3 billion company, maybe they tried for 15 years. And a lot of times we think the, these successes are overnight successes. Like, oh, this, this person wasn't on my radar, hence they weren't trying anything. And then this person shows up on my radar because they're doing something exceptional. And therefore they just tried one thing and it succeeded. Therefore, if I try one thing and it does not succeed, I'm a failure. And the, the, the logic isn't there. Like our, our brains don't always have our best interests at heart to make like the worst mixed metaphor ever. Like our, our brains can talk us into some pretty screwed up stuff and it's not necessarily true. And I think that a lot of times we have to give ourselves a little more credit or a little more time or, or be a little bit more resilient with failure. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And, um, you know, a lot of times I think that's, that's where a lot of unhappiness comes in is just this, this sort of artificial timeline. Well, if I'm not this, in 12 months, I'm quitting, right? Or I should be this, or, you know, Scott Todd's closed 197 deals last year. So I should close at least 90, right? I'm doing the same thing as him. And then, you know, but you don't see all the other things. Like we take this handful of sand, we call it the desert and it can make us miserable, right? So how do we, how do we consciously reconcile the handful of sand calling it the desert sort of phenomenon where we can say to our, we can, we can lock out that, that voice in our head that, that's just beating us up and saying, you know, you should be better. You're not enough. You're, you're a failure. You know, your, your brother-in-law is a doctor. What's wrong with you? Right? Like, how do you, how do you block that out and be like, okay, this is good enough. It's tough. Like it, it's honest to God tough to do that but i for myself personally the way that i kind of reconcile that is i'm a big systems and processes guy like i'm really bad at setting goals for myself but i'm really good at creating systems where i can where i can like i said in the beginning like i can look for consistency i can look for truth and consistency by running processes so for example writing writing a book right like i could think okay i'm not going to be a success until i'm on like the the top of the new york times bestseller list well that is almost impossible to crack and there are so many external factors to get to that outcome so i think when we attach success to external outcomes which we don't have that much control over it becomes a losing battle whereas if we focus instead of like the big goal, and it, I'm happy to dream big, but I don't want to tie my worth to that big dream. So if instead I start to think about, okay, what processes do I have control over that I can manage and run through? So in order to write a book, I have to write a proposal. I have to write an outline. I have to write it chapter by chapter. If I sit down and look at my to-do list and it says write book, I, I'm going to be completely overwhelmed because I can't sit down and write a book. I can sit down and write a chapter outline or I can sit down and write one chapter and then the next week 
write another chapter. And so if I follow a process, I basically win or I'm successful when I've completed that process outside of external outcome, outside of external anything. If I, if I set a process or a system for myself and I follow that, then I win. Whereas if I have this goal and I attach my worth to this goal and it doesn't happen, I, I, feel, I feel like a failure. Whereas like I could sell, say I don't make the New York Times bestseller list, but I sell like say 2000 copies. And of those 2000 copies, a couple hundred people read it and their lives are changed for the better. Or even if like two or three people, their lives are changed for the better. Then that kind of still feels like a win to me. So I think that we're, we're and this was uh, from a, a yoga text, but we're basically, we're not entitled to the fruits of our labor. We're only entitled to the labor itself. So I think when we start to create like systems for ourselves that we can follow and then win by following them, then it removes this, this like, this comparison trap or this like thievery of joy idea that we have in our own minds. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really sort of like this profound, um, almost like Zen like state that you're, you're sort of espousing, um, with the company of one, you know, in a way it's like for the, for the Western mind, like you can't, you can't determine, you can't control what happens externally. Right. Um, but you can internally, right? You can certainly take a lot of joy and value in just the labor itself. And whether anyone buys Company of One or a million people buy Company of One, Paul Jarvis has no control of it. But you do have control of the process of sitting down, thinking about the book, adding value to the world. And even if it's just for Scott and I, right? Great. Like you'll send us a, a copy, signed, hopefully. See how I did that? See how I did that, Scott? Yeah, it's good. Really smooth. Good. So smooth. So really good. Smooth. So, so, S Scott, like, how, how do we, how do we deal with the should factor? And I'll give you an example. Right, this morning, I woke up late, which I rarely do, but I slept in, and I thought to myself, I should be working out, right? I should be meditating, and I should be, uh, you know, doing this before you know, I take the kids to school and I didn't do it and I felt badly about it. Right. How do you, how do we reconcile the should, 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 I should be like Paul Jarvis, right? I should have, a, I should be writing a book and I should have a hot and whistling contract or, and all of this. I'm already right. I have written a book, Paul, right. But I don't have a literary agent. So how do we get over the, the should piece? Uh, to me, that's, to me, that's where the, the goals come in, right? Like the goal, writing down your goals and knowing where you, you want to go and then giving yourself the, the freedom to achieve them on your terms, right? Like it's not necessarily you, someone else's standard, it's your standard. And if you, if you have your goals in place and you know what you're trying to achieve, what does it matter if you do it first thing in the morning or if you do it w whatever time you want to, you know, like you wanted to sleep in this morning or, you know, like you felt, you felt the desire to sleep in this morning, that's the freedom that you have bought yourself. You know, you've, you've purchased that, that right to do that through all your hard work, right? It has nothing to do with what someone else's standard should be. In fact, you know, like I'm, I'm, I wake up every morning. I'm like, man, I should work out before Mark does and doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. So Paul, what's your should battle? Ah, uh, pretty much everything. Like I should be, I should be I, like, I should be pumping out more words per day. Uh, I should have, I should have reached a higher MRR um, for my software companies. Like they're pretty much everything. Like, like I am, I'm a weird mix of like very ambitious, but also not very goal oriented, <laughs> <laughs> which kind of screws up my brain a little bit. But I, I think that, um, it's interesting because it, like in looking at, I'm trying to remember the book. Oh, it was the, the magic of thinking big by uh, David Schwartz, who basically talks about like successful people assume they're successful and go about proving themselves right. And I think that that's a, that's an easier mindset and it's a less harsh mindset than, than this like comparison trap. Like if you just, if you just take care of you outside of, outside of other people, like, if my software company is doing well to support myself and the developer, then that, like, what's the, like, what's the problem if it's not like $500,000 MRR kind of thing? 
like if it's if it's bringing us way more money than we're putting into it then that that kind of feels like we're succeeding or with with the book like i've already got paid a pretty big advance for that book obviously i still have to write it but like i've already kind of like i i followed the steps that i that i laid out for myself with like getting an agent her pitching it to to publishers and stuff and then getting an advance for it so i i obviously I still want to make it good i still want people to buy it but like I've the, the process thus far has been a success for me. And so it's just a, yeah, it's just, it's weird. Like our brains don't always have our best interests in mind. Yeah. Ever. It's funny. Cause my, my wife looked at me the other day and she's like, Mark, why can't you just be, I'm like, cause I'm always, I'm always, I'm always on to the, my should task list, right? I'm going to work out. I'm going to meditate. I'm going to try this new thing. I have to be honest. Like I feel better when I do these things. Actually, I don't feel. I feel badly when I miss a workout or I miss a meditation session. Um, I feel anxious, in a way. So, but I think she has a point. Like, I am a little hard on myself. Like, why can't I just be? Like, why can't I just sit in front of a Netflix movie and eat some Cheetos? I would never. I would never do that. By the way. Well, my, right. my wife says that I'm really good at being on vacation for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> the first 10 minutes, I'm really great at relaxing. And then after that, it's just so. So you it, can't be either. No. I, Can you be, Scott? No. And, be. And, no. In fact, uh, like my wife, you know, Mark, um, at, the la- you know, at the last boot camp in Vegas, I had spent some time there with my wife. And, um, and I was like, man, okay, I got to do this. I gotta, she's like, Scott. What are you doing? Like, take, stop. Like, I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. I got to do this. She's like, no, 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 stop. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? And she said, you know, it, it's okay. Like, you, you don't have to go do that. No one, no one says you have to. You're the one that says you have to. And I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, you know, you, she's like, you know, you, um, you keep telling me like you want to go and get away and then you go and you get away and you're not getting away. And I'm like, okay, uh, phone goes back in the pocket, you know, like it, it, it's like, it was good to have that accountability partner, if you will, that would call me out on that. Yeah. My, my wife's my, <laughs> my, she calls you out, huh? She calls me out on it all the time. And she's like, are you annoyed that I'm always calling you out on this stuff? I'm like, no, I need someone to call me out on this because I left my own devices. Won't call myself out on it. Right. I went out on the boat the other day, Mark, and um, and I was like, okay, I, I am going to not look at this stupid phone. It was Mother's Day, you know, like, and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to look at this this uh, phone at all. And then uh, to make sure I didn't, I took off my glasses that would help me to read and to see, I because I don't need them for distance. It's more close, a little bit of distance, but not, I can still drive the boat without them. And then I put on my sunglasses, which are not prescription. And then I couldn't see my phone, right? Like it was the greatest day ever. I couldn't read my phone. <laughs> and if I needed to, I could, I had my daughter and my wife with me. They could say, hey, go this way. I find my best days are when I don't remember to look at my phone. Like I was two weeks ago, I took a helicopter up to some glaciers and I didn't even think about for the for the helicopter ride there and back. I didn't even think that I didn't even think about my phone. It was like sitting in my pocket too. But I find that when I'm doing things that I'm really really interested in, or I'm just enjoying the moment or the present, then I don't, like I'm not even tempted. Because my wife does the same thing. She's like, why are you looking at your phone? Like, why are you taking pictures of something all the time? Because I have a ton of camera gear. She's like, just look at the thing. <laughs> like it still exists if you don't take that picture and post it to Instagram. Yeah, I mean, in a way, we as as people are are losing the ability to focus. It's actually becoming a lost art, if you will, to sit and just read and just be, because the phones are right there. You get that instant gratification. You get that dopamine hit, and next thing you know, you're off to the races, and I'm looking at cat videos or whatever it is. So anyways, we're getting off topic here about Company of One and Paul Jarvis. So Paul Jarvis, let's put you on the spot. You ready? Yes. You, your, your mentorship, this, this podcast has been phenomenal. So I want to I thank you. Cool. And, um, you know, I guess before we get to your tip of the week, is there any question we should have asked you that we didn't ask you? That is a good question. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. 
Okay. Well, maybe we have to come back. You know, right. you think of it. So tip of the week, website, resource, book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? So I didn't even mean to make this like the best segue in the entire world from the exact thing we were just talking about because I had the tip before we started recording. But the tip is the Cal Newport's book, Deep Work, and it's rules for, stay, for focused success in a distracted world, which is exactly what we were just talking about. So I think that figuring out the, and I, I think that focus uh, over a long period of time is like, a, is like a muscle that you work out at the gym. So if you are addicted to social media or checking your phone all the time, you can't just will yourself into working for hours on end. Like you, have to, you have to work at it. You have to kind of build yourself up to doing that. And I think Cal's book does a really good job at showing why that's necessary, why that's valuable in any job and how that can help set you apart in any job because the more focused you are, the more efficient you can get. So I think that's probably like, it, it's all the things that we were talking about, but written out in a, in a really smart and, uh, and, and good way. So Cal Newport's Deep Work. I read that book and it changed my life. I'd start checking email so, twice a day. And then um, I was really focused and then I, you know, somehow I fell off the bandwagon and now I'm like back to being my anxious, uh, addicted self. And I'm going like, to go back and read the book again. Like I, I would do commencing times. shutdown. Yeah. I need to do it again. I, I got, it was working for a while and now I'm a drug addict. I'm back. There you go. Yeah. I, that's why I read it three times because it didn't, stick. I loved it. And then it didn't stick for very long. And I was like, okay. This is like, I, there's no logic here. Like I know this works and then I'm not doing it. So I had to read it again and then again. Yeah. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, maybe I'm the blame. Just kept saying like, look at your email. Look at the email. Okay. I'm not going to take the blame. Okay. I got two tips, Mark, two. Okay. But one of them is for Paul, like specifically, because Paul said that, uh, you know, no, no one gets to look over the mistakes, right? And I did just see this website today. And I just put it in the chat too. It's startupgraveyard.io, right? Like they, they're keeping track of all the startups that uh, have failed basically. So maybe like learn from them. I don't know. Like I just saw it come across. So I thought, uh, I thought he might like that one. But my real tip of the week is, and I don't even know how I can say this. Well, look, if you have kids in the car, turn, turn down the radio, turn, turn down however you're listening. If not, here you go. It's, it's automate that shit.com. Mark, you see this one? I have. Yeah. Pretty uh, yeah. cool, right? It's like pretty it, cool. It's little things that you like can do, like uh, website screenshot, you know, you just put in the URL and it takes the screenshot that you need and phone number. And they're building more and more tools that will will take things that you might need and automate it and just make it easier to automate your crap. I love it. I love automation. Me too. Um, you know what I find though, and Scott will talk about this on another podcast, is the reconciliation of process versus people, right? Because sometimes I get so processes focused, I forget about the human beings involved. And that's, that's yeah, Paul Drivers is like, yeah, yeah. I, well, that's why you have to swim yeah. lane like I teach. Well, I know. That's why I go to boot camp and learn all this stuff. All right. So my tip of the week is learn more about Paul Jarvis pjv wait pjr pjrvs.com pjrvs.com um check them out um and uh you know certainly pre-order company of one i know i am actually i don't need to because he's just gonna send it to me but <laughs> signed um, and signed as well and, and a signed copy as well because <laughs> then i get to show my kids i'm like look what a big deal i am i know the author they're like, oh, dad, you're cool. So, oh, dad, it's all about it's all about impressing my children at this point. Hey, I I, I went into because uh, I guess I go into Wawa too often. The the grocery store of Wawa, they they know me, so now I walk in there with my kids and my wife, and they're like, hey, Scott, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And I'm like, you know, my daughter's like, oh, geez, dad. I know <laughs> Scott. Scott's like known at first watch. They know his order. Are you yeah. going to go with that egg white omelet again, sir? I, I went there today, Mark, and, and I ordered, and uh, I ordered something different. They're like, wow, that's a change. Yeah, it's, it's bad when I order off the drive through in Starbucks, and they're like, so do you want that Americano too? Like, I'm always ordering for my wife. <laughs> like, they know the order. 
it's 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 kind of cool and it's kind of creepy. All right, so um, I'd want to remind all the listeners: the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Paul Jarvis to come on the podcast is if you do us three little favors: you got to subscribe, you got to rate, you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the ninety-seven dollar passive income launch kit. Also, again, the podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Uh, Scott, you ready? Let's go, Mark. One, One two, two, three. <laughs> Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. Paul's yeah. face the Paul's whole face. time. He was like, what the heck is coming? I didn't know what was going to happen. Right, right. Yeah, like, all of a sudden we're going to jump out in Paul's, like, computer. Hey, we're here. I know. Paul's going to call his agent. Never book me on that podcast again. <laughs> no signed book either. Yeah, right, exactly. I'll just sign ha- I'll just sign Paul or Jarvis at the whole name. <laughs> it, you know, you have to have let, you know, <laughs> let freedom ring in there. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see everyone next time.